Like when the CEO is a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. um, but I must have misunderstood you. You see, we have uh, you and I and a couple of people have batted around the last time about CEO meetings mm-hmm. in the past year or so. Mm-hmm. We were told at one time it's supposed to prove that we're very prepared for this thing. That we're a bad idea for failing to do the program. And that's where we Something to develop us mm-hmm. that is more. Mm-hmm. And <coughs> I had a very short only two publication that did not include a failure to do something else. Does it have to <coughs> be a mandatory one? Is my question. That's a very critical question. I'm not sure. I was trying to well, it wasn't in, infer it from what you said about your explanation of CEAs earlier, it sounded almost like they were recycled. To protect the company and develop them more. It would seem like it's mandatory to do something that you don't feel. Should you have an excuse? No, we don't do that. Well, I'm sorry? It's the only legal document. We don't do uh, even the approval letter from uh, our department. It's not a requirement. It's not. Absolutely not. The town I live in, Monmouth, has a main reliable project coming through as a developer, CMP. Okay. They're building the power line, rebuilding the substation completely. They're contemplating putting in a field of dreams, a, a industrial commercial park. I call it field of dreams because many towns have gone this route, but uh, and that has nothing to do, there's not going to be a CEA for a developer. It is not mandatory. What is mandatory? It's to answer that the was question. My question. Yeah. yeah. What, d- let me answer you this way. What is mandatory, what is required by the statute, is that if you have a failure to do something, and you can demonstrate that you include the terms of the credit retention agreement in the. Um, So that when you go um, to the private hearing or the hearing of the community, everybody in the town and the private hearing can go to the town meeting and see what the general terms of the credit retention agreement are. Now, to continue answering your question, typically, I, I haven't seen anything where uh, there isn't, you know, there's a company or developer involved and there hasn't been a credit retention agreement. That's just the end of two months that I've been reviewing applications. Now, in the project itself, they're in both. both, Because if you remember, if you remember to one of the earlier slides when I talked about the legislation that basically uh, made it, uh, allowed it for uh, municipalities to send money directly back to the company or developer. Okay, so it doesn't show the retention agreement in the same fashion. But to finish answering your question, typically in terms of the project itself, so you know, bear in mind that the residents of the town will look at, you know, here we go, here's a sample application that says, well, we are going to make this proposal. We include the terms of the credit retention agreement. We, um, you know, in this case, County and the company uh, basically sent uh, additionally uh, a, a 
friends who are my best friends and I've known for um, the beginning for me to work on. Um, I typically do that to make sure that I, you know, I play a match or two with everybody on the team that I can. Uh, but you know, typically what's required is actually the two parties playing and the player presentation of the match. So when we do our interpret and get the final um, portfolio completed, the player presentation of the match for our college. Um, I haven't personally, but I have mentored many um, women who are kind of quit that did not have the player representation of the match. But that you know, that's just me looking at the world. It's just my own personal. Um, this is just kind of an old song by the Atlanta Symphony that I wrote when I was a teenager. Yes, that's how I see it. It's a legal binding document. It's like a mortgage. That's, I mean, that's bonded. I mean, that's it's a legal binding document. So it's supposed to feel good, but in practice, you're never going to be able to back out of this dress? Uh, you know, I have recently reviewed uh, an application for an amendment where I would need to penalty and then in this case, the Russian developer who had such a long time relationship uh, that they did sort of things in a breach of, you know, Why would you deal a developer a credit in his degree when he's already put his mind <coughs> to com doing a project by investing in study, net powers, and, and many engineering that can come to a, a quite a portion of the project itself? Hasn't he already committed himself? Or has, wouldn't it be more reasonable to expect a developer to come in and say, first of all, I know how much money this project is going to cost me to put up. Second of all, let's nail down a credit in his agreement right now so I know going forward with my investment where my money is. Why would he wait and f invest millions and then suddenly come and say, well, now I want a credit in his agreement? It doesn't make sense. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that with my money. If I knew I wanted to do a project in a town and I knew they had an opportunity for a TIF and credit enhancement agreement, that'd be one of the first things I want to know right off the bat. To me, that's just me. Yeah, that's, again, that's, it's a good thing that you're, the purposes of these meetings and, again, further communication and the practice here are to ask your questions and have your local officials answer them as opposed to a specific case. Um, <coughs> this is the way I kind of think of credit enhancement agreements. Please tell me if but it seems like the, the kind of the general overview of a credit enhancement agreement is kind of the carrot that you give to the, to the developer because the developer is going to give you jobs. So you're kind of giving some money back and you're kind of, you know, it, it's almost like a bribe or something for that particular developer to come to your town because you're giving them money back for this credit enhancement agreement. And in a lot of circles I'm hearing that that's bad. Why, why are you giving money back to the developer? You know, why are you doing this? But it seems to me that sometimes you can use a credit enhancement agreement to get something that might not be allowed under TIF, TIF law. And I'll use a, an example. I don't know if it's true or not. But suppose Dick Steele wants an Air Force. It's not under the TIF approved project. But we go to the developer and we say, okay, Mr. Developer, you put an incredible landing strip here and a helicopter pad and you maintain that. We'll give you a credit enhancement agreement if you'll maintain this airport for the town of Dixfield. Now, would that be okay under your scenario? Because it's between us and the developer, and it's economic development. Who knows when you use that airport? Well, I don't really know the finances of a particular company. It may well, be well, I'm just saying, that's an example. I mean, it may not be an airport, but it, it's, it's a way to get something from the municipality that you might not be able to get under TIF law. So that's why you might do a credit enhancement agreement, not because it benefits the developer, but because it's something the municipality wants, and that's the only way they can get it. But it's also well, remember that the credit enhancement that but, it would develop the town, but it also does the town, too, because the town wants the airport. <laughs> remember that it's what's inside the, the credit enhancement agreement. It's not a, you know, a credit enhancement agreement is one, it's a one-page agreement. It's 
what you might feel like you're meant to say. You could sort of try it again and just change it to change. Let me just give you an example. Let's say that you need to write something with your name and you just write it out in a piece of paper. You couldn't uh, establish that sentence any further <coughs> if you need to go and and or if you need to like to get another room to stay with them, you just write that out. And let's say you write one room to stay. care what's between the child and the developer? I wouldn't be careful and I wouldn't be remote um, for um, you know, the behavior um, component. You know, what, what the education is going to be, uh, if they're extrovert, if they're the chill about. Uh, I do read every third English in the room to make sure that comes to us. So it's whatever the developer or the town want to do and put together. I mean, it could be, you know, it could be anything, right? I mean, the department doesn't care, but as long as it's properly laid out and funded and in the tip, <laughs> stated in the tip and it's voted on by the town. Right. It's just going to be, so remember, it's our kids. I'm talking about the credit enhancement agreement. The credit enhancement agreement, in my experience, it stipulates all of that, and the parties feel that as negotiations and early steps in preparing for the important and the contentious uh, occurring, then you will have figured that amongst yourselves so that it's really agreed. The credit enhancement agreements, are they subject to the same s statutory projects that are in the TIP law? Because you said that under the TIP law, there's certain projects that are allowed, and it's in the law, and this is the way TIP's got to follow that. Yes. Credit enhancements have, follow, have to follow those same statutory projects? Right. The company is going to make the case to you that um, they need to develop a certain project. Um, and the case that they need to make to you is that it's going to uh, basically further economic development for the community. Why would that not be under the TIP? Why is it not in the TIP and why is it in the credit 